Computers need to remember large amounts of data, and there's a, a variety of different media available. We're particularly concerned with storing information so that it's immediately available to the computer processor, so that we don't talk about things like CDs, DVDs, memory sticks and floppy disks, except to point out that most of them work by rotating an object that carries the data past a mechanism that can read it or alter it, so that at any instant most of the data is physically located some distance away from the read-write mechanism and it's necessary to wait until it rotates into position before it can be accessed. Because of that latency, as it's called, all of these approaches are too slow to be used as the main data storage mechanism inside a computer. For that, we want something that allows us to access a large number of individual locations with no latency. Every location should be accessible in the same very short time. The type of memory that we're going to design is called random access memory. The name reflects the fact that the storage locations can be accessed in any order at the same speed. We'll build the memory using an array of flip-flops. We need to allow for the fact that computers read or write a word of information at a time when accessing memory. That is to say, a group of 8, 16, 32 or 64 bits. And we need to develop some way of specifying the location that will be accessed. We'll do that by supplying the memory with a number, which is called the address of the word that we're reading or writing. Finally, before we get to the actual design, a slight complication. Unlike disk, disk sizes that tend to be specified in bytes, memory sizes are usually specified in bits, although other storage media, media are usually quoted in terms of the number of bytes that they contain. A typical memory device is a chip or integrated circuit, a, a little black rectangle with a number of wires which carry electrical signals and are also used to mount the device physically on a printed circuit board. If there are n wires carrying address information, the chip will have 2 to the power of n storage locations. That, as you should be aware, is because an n-bit number can have 2 to the n possible values. The number of data inputs varies. The chip may have a, a single data input, and if we want a 64-bit word, we therefore need to assemble 64 chips and load them all in parallel. Or the chip may have, say, four bits of data input, so we'd only need 16 of them to make up a memory for computers with 64-bit words. In any case, in the memory modules you can buy, the chips have already been assembled into whatever groups are necessary for the computer's word size. What we're considering is the design of the underlying circuits. And we'll start with the simplest case, a device that can read and write a single bit of data at a time. The single data line shown in the diagram is used both for writing data into the memory chip and for reading data from it. There are also a couple of control inputs. The one on the left is called chip select, and it's active low, so that when the voltage on that input is low, the computer can read information from or write information to the memory. Which of those actions is actually performed is specified by the read not write control line on the right hand side. If that control input is a high voltage, the computer will read a bit of data from the addressed location in the chip. If it's low, the computer will write to the addressed location in the chip. This is quite a complex set of requirements, so let's sneak up on the design in phases. First we'll design some circuitry to get data into memory, and then we'll add some more circuitry to get it back out again. Writing a bit of data to memory involves two actions. The writing itself, which we know all about because it's just loading a bit of data into a flip-flop, but also selecting the right flip-flop to use. We'll do this by providing the memory device with an address, a binary number. And the device has to somehow use that address to select just one flip-flop from an array of flip-flops. And of course, each different address should correspond to a different flip-flop. Fortunately, we've already designed a device that can help us with this task. 
the circuit will input an n-bit binary number and output a signal to load just one out of two to the power of n flip-flops. Maybe you should pause the commentary at this point to review the circuits that we've already designed to pick out the one that will accomplish this. The device we're looking for is a decoder. It inputs a binary number and outputs a true signal on one of two to the power of n output wires. That signal will be sent to a flip-flop and it will clock a bit of data into the flip-flop when it transits from a low to a high or from a high to a low. From our point of view it doesn't really matter very much which. Either type of flip-flop, rising edge triggered or falling edge triggered could be used. So we take the binary address which is encoded and decode it. But that's not all. We have to take into account the control signals chip select and read not write that are input into the memory device. The decoded address should only clock information into the flip-flop if the voltages on the chip select and read not write inputs are low. So now we've got the basic requirements under control and we can start designing the actual circuit. We haven't specified the number of words in the memory. It'll have four addresses. Of course, real memories have millions of addresses, but four, as we've said before, is large enough to generalize from and small enough to fit on a page and be comprehensible. So we'll start with four flip-flops. We have to be able to get data into them, so we organize a data input that's connected to the D inputs of all four. Now you can see that the next problem is making sure that only one flip-flop gets loaded from the data input at a time. We do this by providing each flip-flop with its own independent clock signal. And as, as I've suggested, a decoder is just the right circuit for doing this job. Because it will take an address, our addresses only need to be two bits wide because we're only addressing four bits of memory, and it will turn that address into a true signal on one of four output wires, one for each flip-flop. But you'll note that we haven't connected the decoded address directly to the clock inputs of the flip-flops. Because, as you'll recall, there are other control inputs that we need to take account of. Remember that read not write and chip select both need to be low voltages if the decoded address is to clock a flip-flop. To check if this is the case, we and the inverses of those signals together to produce a signal that's true when one of those control in, when those control inputs are both low. And we combine the output of that gate with the decoded address. So that flip-flop zero, for example, which is the one we just connected up, only gets a clock edge when its address is detected and the control signals are in the right configuration. So to recapitulate, a clock edge will reach the top flip-flop to make it load a bit of data if the address is zero, and chip select is low, and read not write is low. The other flip-flops get loaded when the control signals have the same configuration, but when the address is one, two, or three. So that's it. A circuit that will load data into one specified flip-flop when control signals say that the chip is activated and a load is to be performed. Now we can work on the converse problem, getting data back out again. To design a read-write RAM, we'll leave the circuitry that we've already designed intact and add some more. This new circuitry will have the job of getting the output from a selected flip-flop and delivering it to the outside world at least insofar as a data line can represent the outside world. If we AND together the output Q of the flip-flop at address 0, and the decoder output that's true when the address is 0, then we produce a signal that will be true when the flip-flop is addressed, provided it contains a 1, and 0 or false otherwise. If we do the same thing for each of the other flip-flops, then we get a set of four signals 
only one of which can be true, because only one of the AND gates will get a true input from the decoder. And that AND gate will only produce a true output if the data in its flip-flop is true. So if we then feed the outputs from those AND gates through an OR gate, it will produce a 1 output only if the addressed flip-flop contains a 1, and a 0 output if the addressed flip-flop contains a 0. The only remaining task is to organize another little sub-circuit so that this signal only drives the data line when the computer needs to read from the memory. To do this, we connect a tri-state buffer between the output of the OR gate and the data line. The buffer is that little triangular shape we've just added to the circuit. It looks a bit like a multiplexer or a demultiplexer, but there's only one input, on the right-hand side in this case, and one output. So you shouldn't make it, mistake it for either of those other, more complex devices. You remember the tri-state circuit that we added to the inverter, which allowed us to isolate its output wire from any driving voltage, either high or low? Well, a tri-state buffer is a, a simple riff on the same theme that we can use to connect its output to, or isolate its output from, any logic signal that's input to it. So when the control signal, the active low signal coming in from underneath the triangle, when that control signal is low, the tri-state buffer simply outputs whatever signal is present on its input. And when it's high, the tri-state buffer doesn't try to drive the line at all. So the next question is, when should the tri-state buffer get turned on? Whenever a read operation is being performed on the memory. When this happens, the chip select control input will be low and the read not write control input will be high. So we connect up an AND gate, an AND gate with, a con with an active low output that is, to detect that combination of inputs and use it to control the tri-state buffer. And there we have it, a circuit that can store a bit of data in one of four locations chosen by putting a number on the address input, making chip select low, and also putting a low voltage on the read not write control input. And the circuit will also output a bit of stored data from an addressed location when the chip select is made true and the read not write control signal is set high. Oops, there's just one other minor, minor addition to the circuit. We started out to design a memory with four one-bit words. How, difficulty would it be, how difficult would it be to generalize that circuit to words with more bits? Well, not very difficult at all, as it turns out. The address decoding sub-circuit on the left isn't affected by the number of bits in the word, and the column of flip-flops with its associated output circuitry can be replicated any number of times. So to turn our circuit from a memory with four one-bit words into a memory with four four-bit words, we simply add three more columns of flip-flops with their associated output circuitry and connect them up to the existing addressing circuitry and output control circuit, sub-circuit exactly as before. Now this, this, this whole circuit looks, looks quite imposing, but once you've come to grips with the addressing circuitry on the left and the AND and OR gates for getting data out of the flip-flops in the first column, then these other three columns behave in exactly the same way as the first column. So now we've designed a memory that can read and write four four-bit words. If we increase the size of the decoder, then we could add more rows of flip-flops verti vertically to handle more words. That, of course, is necessary to handle the large amounts of storage that modern computers use. And we can add more columns to increase the size of the words. Surprisingly, that's not so important. Although current computers are usually based on 32 or 64-bit words, their memory modules are in fact usually assembled for a n from a number of chips with smaller word sizes that are loaded in parallel. For example, 64 chips with 1-bit words or 8 chips with 8-bit words. So this small-sized word is not, uh, not such a great restriction. <laughs>